Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us here. Uh, you know, since the, the conversation ended on the listing issue, let me start with that. Because money, you're the only listed guy in the book. You're aspiring to go public. So let me start by asking you, what has been the journey like? I mean, the IPO was a blockbuster success. Uh, given the fact that the market was in a dismal point, but, you know, you, you managed to uh, be oversubscribed 12.5 times, if my memory serves me right. What's the experience been like being listed? <clears throat> no different. Really? Absolutely no different. We have been focusing on our business, on our users, on our product for many, many years. We continue to do the same. But I must confess that we had our first venture investor in 2006. I think since then, we have been running our business like a listed company. Mm. There, is, there is responsibility, there's quarter on quarter targets. Things are revisited, discussed, so it was not like you're flooding with ideas and then you drop them and take up new ideas. But no, it was that way. So I would say I have not personally felt the difference, except for the it's a bit hard on time because you take out time to meet uh, your investors and you take out time to go to investor conferences and those calls and other things. And yes. you have to be on CNBC TV 18 every quarter taking us through your numbers to the last decimal point. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so you would advise them to go that route? Definitely. Why not? Absolutely. I mean, that is, uh, I would definitely agree with Mr. Murthy that it is a big responsibility because now you, you, are, you are taking care, there are so many retail investors, there is after all middle class money that is invested through mutual funds or any other fund that mm. comes and invests with you. So you have to be extremely careful about that. Uh, uh, definitely, there is a lot of, uh, um, uh, I mean, definitely I would uh, go into the path of earning a better name as a company, more respect and honor than uh, really choose any shortcut, any, uh, any such methods. You know. So never keep your eyes on your stock prices. Just focus on your business and really? your product. You're not keeping business. your eye on the stock price. Not at all. In fact, there are many days I don't even look at it. <laughs> okay, so Uday Vishal, all set for an IPO now? There are a bunch of things which go into uh, getting set for an IPO. I think we're on that path. Um, I won't say that we're, we're there as yet. Uh, uh, it'll take some more time, but it should be very shortly. Vishal? I mean, uh, one of the earlier panelists said that it's not it's not the end, it's actually the beginning in many ways. And I yeah. think for us, it's more like a journey. So it's part of that journey. And as you graduate, grow up, it's another source of you know, financing. It's another a way of getting your brand out there. Mm -hmm. It's exit for your existing investors. So it's a combination of various things. But it's not, um, I think if you're, if you're running a business, that, 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 that doesn't become the aim. It just becomes as part of the evolution as you mature, if that should be the route. Also, I think it's, a, uh, it's necessary, the fact that money is the only person who's a listed company in this room it speaks about the fact that there are uh, su there's such a, sh a sheer dearth of uh, uh, examples of uh, young startups making it out early, creating a successful uh, a yeah. brand in the consumer market or in mm. the enterprise market, raising public money, which gets even greater coverage in the brand, and then is able to attract uh, you know, high-quality talent much more easier. There's a full ecosystem which kicks in, mm -hmm. and investors get exits. Every time I meet a new investor coming into India, he just keeps saying that the only, thing we, the only problem we've got with this country is there are no exits. And, and yeah. uh, the fact that one of our, we, we share a, a common sh a shareholder investor, he's seen this exit, it's, it's moved, there's a bunch of other exits he saw, he's seen, he's more bullish about other companies which are closer to exit yeah. now. I think the practice of taking companies public, participating in, in, in that process and having boards working for those companies and guiding in that direction is an important part. So I think everybody's got a responsibility while you're building this ecosystem to continue to go down that path and and some will get there, some won't, but that's what business is all oh, about. Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, one of the other common things in the book, uh, in the 13 entrepreneurs that we have in the book, uh, companies like Snapdeal, yours, you know, your story as well, the companies that you run today are very different from the companies that you actually started. Take us through from Ask Me to Just Dial, coping with the fact that your first business plan didn't turn out the way that you envisaged it would, uh, dealing with failure, and then having the guts to actually go out there and do it again. <clears throat> so with us, uh, uh, we got the timing wrong the first time. So we thought of a search engine over the phone back then in 1989. And um, we thought uh, there's a dearth of instant information. We said, is there a way people can find free, fast, and accurate information back then in 89? 
uh, but we didn't realize there were only 4 million for telephone connections in India for a population of 850 million Indians. So that, and we, there were no venture capital those, those days, so we kind of struggled for two years and finally I had to gift my shares to my financing partner and just moved out. But I did feel that there is, there is definitely going to be an opportunity for search engines. This was before the internet era, actually. Uh, well, I came from a non-business family. I was also the breadwinner for my family. Of uh, I had three siblings to take care. Uh, I had penniless, actually, honestly speaking. So I had to have this idea of wait for the right timing. And for about three years, four years, I was actually doing odd jobs, odd businesses, to just to save up some money so that I could apply for enough telephone lines so that I could start this business once in 1996 is when I... I, I found it just style uh, where you could dial, dial a number yeah. and get quick information. Uh, as I said, initially we were we were not funded, and it was just a thousand dollar investment that I had, my personal capital. So I, all I could do was provide great service experience to my users and a better return on investment to the advertisers. Yeah. So we said we would focus on delighting our users and they're going to act as our evangelist and because we didn't have money to market so they were the ones word of mouth yeah. the business spread in, in 96 onwards and uh, I always say our initial advertisers are our angel investors actually and we moved on till about 2006 for 10 years no venture capital would ever entertain us because they wouldn't understand this business the at business all part, yeah. because yeah. it's so different and uh, you know it was not and people wanted to compare with something which is there abroad and unfortunately, our business model was unique, and we didn't have replicating any uh, model. Anyway, so when we moved on to the web, it was different. There was just the free and accurate information wouldn't work. What was important was people wanted rich content. They mm. wanted to see pictures, maps, directions, videos. Yeah. So we worked on that. And then we learned in 2010 that we need social uh, integration user reviews and ratings. And, and many of these decisions which we take are actually not necessarily in favor of our customers or our, uh, you, it is quite disruptive in the sense yeah. that if I give in, uh, better ratings and reviews to my free listers, I mean, because the users do it, and advertisers get bad ratings, we still have to put up with that. And we moved on to that, then to the mobile uh, revolution, developing mobile apps. And now we've now focused now on search uh, plus, search plus transaction. Okay, so let me ask the two of you then, Vishal, you know, uh, Money here was talking about how you keep changing your plans or the company keeps evolving itself and the other problem is that sometimes the customers don't understand what you're about and sometimes the customers don't understand how you're going to be able to deliver what you promised to deliver. How did you cope with that challenge? Okay, let me start by asking you. Yeah. I can take whoever. I mean, does this happen often? No, it, it doesn't happen <laughs> often. But it's an interesting question because when we set up um, the service, it was a new service category. You know, third party vendor independent tech support didn't exist. Uh, you would go back to your traditional computer manufacturer or software publishers or your ISP or whoever else, your local, you know, friend yeah. who lives in your village, your grandson who went to college. So all of that got disintermediated by just lower scope and services that were provided. There was an um, opportunity there to create um, a new type of service that would help customers across all the complexity they have in their home and more that's ingratiating through more devices that they're buying. Um, when we set that up, it is a new concept. So the service wasn't delivered in that way. So we had to uh, struggle a little bit to... There wasn't a problem of actually finding the demand. There was a problem of how do you communicate that. And... Uh, at that time, online marketing was new. We were obviously targeting customers in the U.S., U.K., Australia, those geographies. Um, so we had a limited resources in terms of how can you think through things. Even the online platforms, you know, seven years ago weren't yeah. that established. So you had to mm. struggle a little bit with things, but you figure it out. You know, you just work at it. You hit your head hard enough. Sometimes, someday, some idea comes and you figure it out. Right, before you buy Try it before you buy it. That, that's a hallmark of the way our customers engage with us uh, in our service and understand our business. 60-70% of my uh, manpower, we have, out of the people you mentioned, 3,500 people on frontline sales. They take 20,000 phone calls every day from customers who, advertise, who are looking online for help. And they, they, the customer tries to serve the sales mm -hmm. guy as a technician. And then, you, then the service gets transferred to a platform and uh, support queue. 
it's a process but i want to want to add one more thing just yeah. not i don't want to take away too much of your time we started this business with a business plan which till date is relevant uh, we started with the same product we had a target to get to 100 million revenues in 5 years uh, we very <clears throat> we reached very close to that we were the fastest company in india to reach 50 million in 3 years we got there and uh, nothing much changed uh, the only thing that changed is that uh, we thought that we would get away with a little bit of capital and do it i remember uh, mr shivasu was sitting here he was interviewed uh, by by a magazine some 7 years back or 5 years back i don't remember now what, what time and he said what do you think of this company and he says they're going to take a lot of capital to get where they're going to get to and he was totally right we already raised about 90 million i think we need another 90 to get to where we want to get to so it's a, there are few things we didn't understand well but yeah. i think the plan remained where it was you know i want to ask the three of you the question that sandeep was asking uh, about this intuition versus data debate that goes on within corporate boardrooms has there been uh, instances where your gut was proved right and instances where your gut was proved awfully wrong of course more wrong than right more wrong than right <laughs> no actually to be honest uh, you fail far more than actually succeed the, the attempts at several things that you do uh, uh, but uh, also in earlier panel somebody said knowing the local market you know yep. being you know aware of what happens in this country is super important because you have investors who come exposed to international uh, uh, markets and they would generally try to push something which has worked in the western world yeah. and not necessarily may work here mm -hmm. in our company i don't want to take examples but then uh, for example the coupon thing one of our board members said you must go and have a group on kind of a model in this and i knew it, it's not a model that will work in, in india because uh, it was it's it's so different this country yeah. and this market is uh, uh, but yes uh, many leaps that we have taken are due to guts and and the instinct that this is what the next step should be mm. and it kind of worked as work for us as a company but such plus was your wife that not yours right absolutely but then observing <laughs> that seeing that my wife who was not a major tech person who used to barely spend few hours in a week on internet and i hear as a man who spends all the time on net so the big difference that i saw was when she got a smartphone she was subconsciously using internet all the time because she was using whatsapp messenger a facebook app to yeah, be in touch yeah. with friends i said this is only it's a matter of time and all these people are going to move online and do several things so i as a search engine will have a very limited role to play unless i get into the search plus transaction yeah, engine yeah. that's what we are rolling out now so in your case got more right than wrong in in our business i think data takes over intuition <laughs> to a large extent i mean intuition obviously tells you what what to do and but um, there's so much data that we churn whether people are calling us and thousands of people and what type of service requests you're marketing online so you've got digital assets which have become more data driven um, platforms so data actually overrules um, and sometimes it's you know it's intuition but mostly data for me you know you i think uh, uh, it's a, you have to have a, a good balance between uh, yeah. being intuitive in what you think and then and be, being data centric being data centric is, is essentially if you have tons of investors like i have I have seven individual funds which invested in me and in and in us sorry there's no space for that <laughs> no, and so you have to do a lot of data data orientation if you want to raise money in the, in that form and shape especially in that period from 2005 6 7 8 now things are dramatically different even there okay, is so, last check so we're running out of time but let me ask you both about building the brand uh, and let me start by asking you vishal you know you you want to position uh, iyogi as a purposeful brand in the marketplace what has been the strategy to communicate what has been the strategy to actually build this brand which is now operating out of india but uh, servicing global markets right a couple of things one is actually a purpose so so if you're a purposeful brand if you if you mean something to consumers if you're helping their lives solving problems you'll always ingratiate yourself into the into their hearts and and that's actually helped our business so our customers are multi year subscribers average years you know go on for months um so that that's one important aspect the other thing is when you're the the whole aspect of creating a brand has changed with online marketing you can market directly to consumers you can find somebody who's in demand for your products and service and if you're able to serve him at that point you can uh, ingratiate him the the last thing is what they mentioned earlier is actually just a premium based service yeah. so we have we take a bunch of sessions at the front line people experience our service through that service engagement you get them to buy it or they call you back when they're in trouble again before so I, before i get back to money why i yogi 
Well, we wanted to be an Indian brand, and there is uh, there's very little precedence of Indian consumer services brand from India. There isn't actually any. So we wanted to be Indian. We wanted to have an Indian name, Indian feel. We, everyone who works in, in our operation does not use aliases. We, we banish or admonish any kind of practices like that. So that's why our yogi. Uh, people, our consumers, we want them to connect with India through the service that they have. Money? Amita Bachchan brought you as a brand ambassador. Yes. Uh, that must have cost you a lot. Yeah, of course. <laughs> we, we, if you look at our track record, uh, we have tried to deliver what we promised from day one. And uh, so it was all about being relevant because you're aging as a company. As we always say, we're an 18-year-old startup, actually. Because you're constantly got to evolve and your products have to be really relevant to today's time which is what we tried the best in building this brand and continue to make it really a very useful, saving money, saving time kind of con uh, that clicks with the people. We chose Mr. Bachchan because, you know, we have, we, have, oh, we have lasted for so many years. We have continued to change. So is Mr. Bachchan. He has got, you've seen different avatars of Mr. Bachchan. He's still so relevant. He appeals to all age groups, the cross sections of people which in the country. Which avatar of Mr. Bachchan do you see yourself as? <laughs> The earlier ones in the 70s. The, the earlier ones. <laughs> so let me give you 10 seconds to end, Vishal. I'll start by asking you, uh, what is the one thing that you would like to see yourself do? Personally, forget Ayogi, forget the company, but personally, what is the one goal that you have for yourself over the next five to 10 years? Uh, personal goal is, um, I mean, the thing that I've sort of deprived myself of is spending time with my two daughters and getting more culture, which I kind of don't have time for it or space for in my life right now. Uday, personal goal? Uh, we both Kashmiris. Um, I left so am I. So it's a panel of so, so I left, you're outnumbered. <laughs> uh, I left the, uh, the valley nearly 30 years back, and uh, Vishal is still has family there. His parents are there. I haven't gone back since. And uh, our uh, ambition, in, in both in the business and personally, it is for me to, to is important to me too that at some stage we'll establish uh, a presence in, in Ohio and train tons of people there and get jobs into the, into the Kashmir Valley and try and find a way of interacting, integrating back from where we left. And more power to the both of you. Money, I'm going to end by asking you what your <coughs> personal goal is. Be a better singer. I'm just practicing. I'm still not in school. Leave that. Leave that today. Start today. <laughs> um, uh, many, many, many things, but at some point I want to get on to angel investing, but not, not right now, but maybe in the next couple of years. I want to do mentoring and, you know, because I see so much opportunity, like Mr. Murthy said, that the best way to, if you want to really get, get the poverty from this country, face of this country, it's more entrepreneurs, more ideas, and, uh, you know, if I can be part of that, you know, help the government or help the individual smart people uh, with now whatever sing they one knowledge. Line. Sing one line. <laughs> no, really, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mani, Uday, and Vishal, appreciate you joining us here for Young Techs. Thank, Thank you so much, and congratulations, and the very best for the Thank future. Thank you so Thank much. You so Thank, much. You. Thank you, Shireen. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, hi, guys. You know, both of you have built such eminently successful, globally successful product companies in very niche spaces, uh, and neither of you had ever done it before. So it's been a superb achievement. Uh, but one of the things, apart from differentiation, uh, a good business model, uh, understanding your competition, I mean, all those things obviously are true because investors love you. You've all raised three, what, three, 400 crores each. Uh, certainly, uh, just brief, I've been an angel investor in your company, so I certainly have loved you. Uh, to me, uh, one of the aspects that goes beyond the product or the technology, the differentiation, are the human issues. And, and uh, my friend Narayan Murthy mentioned some of those. So I thought, rather than focus a bit on the intrinsics of your business, they're both pretty niche, you may lose some of the audience, I thought I'd focus a bit on the personal issues. So if I ask you just Jaspreet, uh, when you started out, you had three founders. You had an age gap between the three of you, what, 20, 30 years? Pretty what much. were you, 20s? In your 20s, somebody was 50. You're from Delhi. One founder is from Mumbai. The third is from Chennai. What were the challenges? How did you guys emote as one unit? Yeah, it's a good question, Saurabh. Uh, I, I firmly believe we can't plan a startup, right? So uh, circumstances brought us together. 
me and my two other co-founders, we used to be co-workers in uh, my previous job. I was uh, 25, 26. The other co-founder was, I think, 35, and the, the further one, the 45. And uh, I think the core thing was we passionately believed in the, in the end goal of building a, a very solid product story, a global tech story uh, from, from India, and also uh, in the technology itself, in, in building, uh, you know, the, disrupting a, a much larger $10 billion backup and archival market. So the passion of building something substantially large uh, brought us together. Uh, and Synergy was great, uh, still great so far, and, uh, you know, Touchwood and, uh, and scaling the business and uh, understood that uh, people are people and, and you've got, uh, you got to absolutely uh, get your arms around uh, situations and, and work together. Okay. And, you know, you started, you were the youngest of the three, mm -hmm. uh, and now you ended up being the leader. How challenging has that been? Did, did you have to have some special sensitivity uh, to handle those issues? And I mention that because these things are normal. They're, they're par for the course when you do startups. Uh, so people who are listening to you would be, have, would be uh, very keen to understand. Did you have challenges? Absolutely, tons of them. Uh, you know, cultural challenges, people who you hire are obviously far better and more experienced than you. Uh, it's a constant uh, startup is a, is a great because the process itself is very unnatural. It's very, uh, uh, you know, you're squeezing your 30 years of career into five or six years. Uh, it's a war, but it's also a drug. You keep on enjoying and you want more. Uh, so it teaches you a lot. And you, you, you're thrown into circumstances where you, you really come out and you want to come out winner. Uh, and did, you, and did you have to do something extra to make sure that your partners uh, were happy to accept you as a leader, even though you were the youngest? Well, I think all of us were beyond that ego of uh, who is the leader. It was all about uh, who is best in a given role. And my enthusiasm, sometimes my energy, brought me into the forefront of, uh, to a customer. And uh, it, was a, it was a conscious call to sort of, you know, take the best role suited and uh, in the future if I had to step down to let someone in, in uh, would have been just fine by me as well. All of you who are listening to him underst can understand why he transitioned easily. So let me ask you, Manav, I mean, you came from a small town. You didn't even know English in school till you came to college. And you did engineering in Jalandhar, and at that time you didn't even know that there was something like IITs, right? And then you end up with your first job in, in Singapore. What, how challenging was your scaling in that piece? See, uh, I think uh, given the, it really, it really helped me in building the company so far. Uh, and the reason being, you know, coming from a small town when I was in Moga, which is a small town in Punjab, if you go, it's a heartland. It's like 42 small villages put together. And the only way for me to go up was to learn, learn faster than my colleagues would, and train myself at a pace which others couldn't match. So I think that has really stuck me along all my while, while I'm, I've been building the company and thinking ahead of time. So when I joined REC, I realized I'm going to compete with people from all other, uh, all over the country. You know, REC has representation of four people from every state. So learning to speak with them, understanding the culture was very different. Mm -hmm. Coming from Punjab, you are very conservative. You just think along a particular line. Your parents don't want to send you mm -hmm. outside of your region. So it is very different. Uh, so let me ask you both one question because you've done it differently. Now this is about building an organization. It's about scaling. You, you get a good product, you get a good idea, you start a company. But scaling is where many people fail. You've both done it differently. Just please, you moved to the U.S., you relocated, you've built it from there. You've had a different set of challenges. Manav, you've done the same thing, build a global company. You've done it out of fear. Tell me, you guys, I mean, what do you think? What were your challenges? What were your challenges? I think the biggest challenge to scale is, is building the right team first. I am not even from the software background. I only knew the customer pain point. I had no clue about how to build the software. I had no, no clue about to price the software, nothing about it. So I realized early on the only way I can succeed is by hiring people smarter than me and looking at talent at a global level. And that's what I did from day one. So when I hired my head of sales, we were about $3 million company. We were making about $300,000 in profit. And, and that guy was not even wanted to speak with me, saying, you know, we have a, 
very bad experience with working for Indian companies. I'm an American. I will stay in big hotels. I will spend big money. There's no cultural match. You know, I said, fine, let's meet somebody in London. He flew over. I came overnight. And we spent one hour together. We ended up spending half a day together. I convinced him, you know, joining ACA is the best thing. And the underlying that I have realized over that is that every salesperson, if you talk about sales, they want to make big money. They want to make sure that they have good environment to work for it, and they want their freedom. And that's what I have worked on all the time. Every hire that we have made all the while, and everybody has been senior than me, from CFO to chief operating officer, I've gone down to the basic nature that drives them, which is about good environment, ability to make money, and everybody wants to be part of success story. So I think that has really helped in building the company so far. And I guess one of the other things that I read that you've done is that all of your different regions have their own policies. I mean, you, let, you hire locals and you let them operate the way they would otherwise. Has that worked well for you? Yeah. I think policies have to, because they have pronounces of, like, Indian labor laws are different from American labor laws are different from Australia. But I think underlying principles we have kept them. So we are a frugal company. It doesn't mean that we don't spend money. We spend money at the right places. We go to the right meetings. But we won't spend money just for the sake of spending money. We will invest all our money back into R&D. You know, we have not taken any profit back. I could have had very good lifestyle coming from a small town, middle class. I could have had big house, big car. But we made sure that, you know, we invest every bit of money back into R&D. Because we realize product differentiation is going to differentiate as we scale the organization. Mm -hmm. so, so that has really helped us. So we kept the basic culture is something which we don't compromise. Creativity and discipline both have to go hand in hand. But, but different parts of the world have different leave, leave conditions and all the rest, right? right. And also I think uh, it's about changing yourself. I think if you stand up and say that I have made a mistake, yes, I am also learning along with you, and you are my real mm -hmm. business partner, I think that really helps. Just please, what have been your challenges in scaling and building the organization? Yeah, in general, uh, exactly to echo his points, you, you're hiring, you're literally, uh, the only reason you would, you would go to Silicon Valley was, was to get the best talent. Uh, and, uh, you know, to me, I was talking to Ravi before this particular, uh, just, just before this uh, st stage, uh, that one of the people uh, who, uh, who was number two in one of my recent searches, uh, was a CMO, global CMO of a $12 billion company right now, and uh, he wanted to come and work for Driva. And uh, that's the kind of talent I really wanted to get, and, and that's why I ventured out. Uh, scale and culture uh, does bring challenges, and uh, I literally had to, at one point, build my marketing team, fire it all, build it again, uh, and, and went to a third iteration recently. So you, you, it, it takes time to sometimes adjust, uh, but the, you know, it's a sacrifice you have to make, or delayed graduation you have to make, to uh, to get to get to the talent pool you really, really want to get to and uh, and, and, and and get them in. So tell me, just read, you know, uh, you've been very successful at raising money from different classes of investors. Mm -hmm. I mean, you raised money from the Indian Angel Network to start with, then it was Sequoia, then a bunch of VC funds, and you've managed a very good relationships. Mm -hmm. How has that worked for you? I mean, have you been able to draw a lot of value out of your investors? Absolutely. My, my board is a phenomenal board. Uh, we have Sequoia and Nexus. Uh, in fact, one of our largest competitors uh, also bought a small stake, EMC. Uh, I think the important part of the whole equation is that it's a marriage of equals. Uh, the, uh, when I'm, uh, you know, the, the whole situation of board works really well if, uh, if they don't dictate it's a, it's a marriage of equal when you challenge each other. In fact, every single uh, breakfast meeting I have with my board members, we both leave the table with a to-do list. It's not just me, it's even them. I, I, I give them a to-do list of things they got to do till the next board meeting and, and be responsible. So the whole nudging, the whole challenging each other makes it the, the, the struggle of equals and the marriage of equals. And, and the overall, the board evolves. And I had to fire a board member. Uh, you know, even sometimes you've got to do that to, to keep the whole, the voting structure. So, Manav, you know, in, in any company as it grows and scales, uh, there are some inflection points. There are some key moments. So, if you look at the history of a company, you'll always remember some key things. If they hadn't happened, maybe you wouldn't have built the company. Can you think of a couple of those in your company? Yes, I think uh, there are three, four of them. 
I think first was to, you know, getting the angel funding. So when I started the business in 2004, there were no angel networks like what we have in INR or in other networks. So I had no option. There was, I didn't know how to, how to go about raising the, the first capital. I had saved about, from my, from my job, I had saved about $20,000. So I used that for about three, four months. And then I was sitting, I was in uh, Singapore that time. I was thinking, go back to India, let's try to do something. Then one fine day, I just walked into, you know, the previous employer, chairman of the company, Mr. Kirisha, and just knocked on his door. And I said, you know, this is what I want to do. Would you really invest? And he was kind enough to commit million dollars. So I think that was a really, really the first. If I had that money, I wouldn't have put money into research and could not have built the first the version next, of the product. The next big one? Next big one was getting a million dollar, you know, $40 billion company to our customer. And the CEO was, he didn't want to believe Indian companies can do it. They can come and sell a mission critical software that can scale up to a $30 million business and, and still service them year on year with investment R&D. That was a really big thing. And I think that cup of coffee approach really helped. I went to Starbucks and I sat in front of his office saying, whenever you're out, I'm here. Less than 15 minutes cup of coffee is your lunch time. Give me 15 minutes. And then he realized, uh, agreed with my vision, and, and he gave us the contract. That was the second one. You took the chance to fly down and sit in the Starbucks. Yes. <laughs> and I think that the, the third mm -hmm. one was uh, really getting the head of sales, which I was explaining before. I think yeah. that was, he really helped me build the company for mm -hmm. the last five years. He was in the five years. And last one was getting Silver Lake as an investor. You know, getting global investor who has never invested in India was, was a big thing. So I think those are the moments which really helped us feature so far. Great. Jaspreet, can you think of your moments? Yeah, very, very similar. I think uh, getting some awesome customers uh, was a great inflection point because we sell storage and security. So trust is very important. I think uh, when you got, you know, the almost uh, the half of NASA deployed on our solution, uh, we, we got a big part of U.S. Army. We had, you know, a couple of good customers. They all pushed us forward as great customers, as, as also great uh, evangelists. Uh, uh, Another interesting, probably, uh, inflection point was when Gartner ranked us number one. In the list, we had HP, Symantec, EMC, IBM, and we were number one in our category, and uh, then initially, we strongly controlled. Uh, that really, really pushed a, a very small company big time forward, and, and getting a great board and great team uh, was, was, was awesome as well. Uh, I think I've been blessed to have a with a great set of investors throughout my journey and uh, also great team members. And, uh, yeah. Okay. So let me ask you guys one thing. You just heard Narayan Murthy talk about public, going public. So a lot of entrepreneurs believe that going IPO is an exit. He just reminded you that that's actually when your responsibilities really start. So what do you guys want to do? You so, so I think we're building a company for long term. I think I equate going, we are public as far as we have in board of investors, Solar Lake, Nexus, and we have angel investors. So I think we are as transparent as, we don't come like public. So you're going to go public. Yeah. That's your ambition. Yes. Just please. Yeah, I think public, going public is a graduation ceremony. You just, you just become liable first time to do the big things. Right now, you're just doing an experiment. So yes, growing bigger and uh, growing stronger, but yeah, let's see what would happen in the field. Great. So here's a suggestion I have for both of you before our time runs out. Try and catch hold of Narayan Murthy. Go and spend some time with him. If you're planning to be public, he's the best role model you can get. Okay. Great. And all the very best to both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Shivastav, Jaspreet, and Manas.